That's what we wanna see. Let's, let's pray to the Father. Heavenly Father, we pray with great expectation, with all hope, and in all humility, Father, that you would use us to bring about revival. Father, would you see fit to use Graceland Church to take your kingdom and to share it across all of Southern Indiana, this state, across the world. Father, would you bring about revival and awakening, a movement among your people, Father. Thank you so much for, for today and to be able to sing these praises to you. We thank you for Jesus and it is upon his name that we gather here today. Father, we bring your word and pray that you would use it. Would it cut, would it pierce to the heart, the hearers today? Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. So good to be with you this morning. My name is Ryan Brown. I serve here as one of the pastors, and I don't get to do this all that often. And so when I do, man, I just, I count it a privilege, and it's a, it's, it's a, a weighty, heavy thing that I don't want to take lightly. So um, I look forward to what, what God's going to do in this place today. To get started, if you allow me, I want to take you back seven years, nearly seven years, to June of 2017. At this point, I, um, I'm serving as our student ministries pastor here at Graceland, and um, we're approaching a, a week of high school camp, a week of high school camp. And a little bit of backstory, I'm 34 years old, and at this time, I still thought I was a young, like, spring chicken, and that my body could hold up against anything, that I was in invincible. And if you were to ask my wife, even back then, she'd be like, no, not at all. Um, and a quick aside, quick aside, in fact, um, when I was uh, doing student ministry, she would regularly tell me a couple things before any event, especially before camp. She would say two things. One, I love you. Two, don't get hurt. <laughs> don't get hurt. And so, um, back to the story, June 2017, and we're getting ready to go on camp, and I'm working out over at Graceland's gym, and I'm doing what are called like these overhead dumbbell um, things. I'm really into working out, you can tell. And I'm laying on a bench, and, and that's when I feel it, like this pop in my, in my lower back, my lower back. Um, fast forward uh, to February of 2022, and from, from this time, nearly five years, I no longer try to lift heavy things. I no longer think I'm in, invincible, for sure. Um, my strength, my flexibility, all kinds of things have begun to go down. But in February of 2022 uh, is when my back went out. Have you ever heard that before, like someone's back goes out? And I didn't really know what people meant until it happened. But what it did was it completely laid me out. And what I mean by that is like on the floor. I couldn't even lay in my bed. I was just laying on the floor on a hard surface for nearly a week. And the culmination of all of this uh, was when um, Jenny's like, Ryan, it's been a couple days. I think you need to get a shower. And, and I, I, I didn't feel well, and I was so powerless, I didn't feel well enough to go upstairs to get into the shower. And so she brought down a bowl with some shampoo and some water, and right there on our, on our floor, she washed my hair. And in that moment, in that whole experience, I just felt so powerless. I felt so powerless. I know that there are people in our church family, in our, in our community right now that just feel absolutely powerless. Maybe you're one of them in this place this morning. If you don't feel that way right now, it's likely that you felt powerless at some point in your life. But what we're gonna look at today is just a beautiful example and a depiction of great power, of great power. If you have your Bible with you, I wanna invite you to open it up with me to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two, we're gonna look at verses one through 12. I'll read those for us in just a moment. And if you're, if you're new to church, or maybe even if you don't have a Bible, there is one there in the pew back in front of you. Um, if you look at the, the Bible, uh, a good bit of it, like two thirds of it is the Old Testament, uh, but the latter third is called the New Testament, and the first four books of the New Testament are called the Gospels of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then right after that, 
we've got the book of Acts, which is where we're going to be today. Go ahead and open that up. It's page 909 if you wanna go ahead and flip to the, to the Pew Bible. Um, if you're with us online, I'd also, um, we'd love to get you a Bible. And so if you don't have a Bible and you want a Bible, uh, let us know in the chat there or even in a private chat, and we would love to collect your information and send you a Bible. But that is something that's really important to us here at Graceland. One of our church values is to stand on the word, to stand on the word of God. It directs everything that we believe and do, and so we want you to have access to the Bible. So if you're here in the worship center, take that Bible home with you. Get to reading that thing, because I promise you that when you get into the word of God, it will get into your heart and it will change you. So let's do that. Um, Before we jump in, and read. I do wanna give also a little bit of background. We're in our second week of this sermon series called Acts of the Holy Spirit. If you weren't with us last week, Pastor Nate, he kicked off this sermon series by looking at Acts chapter one. He talked to us about anticipating the promises of God, anticipating the coming of the Holy Spirit. And if you've not checked that out, you can actually find our YouTube page. Uh, Just go to YouTube and search Graceland Church. You can check out that video sometime this week. Um, But this week, we're gonna turn our attention to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. And we're gonna see here that a promise comes to reality. Promise comes to reality. So if a promise, uh, if we're anticipating the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit, today we're looking that promise come into reality. Come into reality. And so um, to do that, Uh, we're gonna look at Acts chapter two, verses one through 12. I wanna invite you to stand to your feet in the reverence for the word of God. Hopefully you found your way there. I am going to read verses one through 12, and you can follow along on the screens with me as well. Acts chapter two, verse one through 12. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of, as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse five. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes, and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Verse 12, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? This is God's word written down for you and for me, and we all said together, thanks be to God. You can go ahead and be seated. With our time together this morning, we don't have a lot, but here's what I'd like to do. I wanna answer a couple of questions this morning. The first question is posed to us there in verse 12. What does this mean? What does this mean? That's something we want to address this day. What does it mean that the Holy Spirit has now come down? What does this mean to be empowered by the Holy Spirit? I wanna give you three truths here in just a moment to talk all through that. And then a little bit later at the end of the sermon, we're gonna look at verses 36 through 39. So if you wanna keep your finger there in Acts chapter two, I'm gonna read verses 36 through 39. And then there's another question that's there in verse 37, and it's this. What shall we do? What shall we do? So first, what does this mean? Three truths that I think unpack for us what it means to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then... We're gonna look at verses 36 through 39 and answer that question that was posed to Peter and to the other apostles there. What shall we do? All right, ready to go? Ready to go? All right, buckle in. Let's do this thing. Here we go. Acts chapter two. It's all about the promise of the Holy Spirit coming down and resting on the people of God. And we see that this promise was actually given to us from Jesus himself. There are several places talking about this, but I wanna point you to two. 
Jesus talks about the promised Holy Spirit coming. We see it a lot in Acts, or excuse me, John chapters 14 through 16. So this is before Jesus has gone to the cross. This is before Jesus has been raised um, from the grave. And it's there that he tells his uh, disciples, he says, I'm gonna leave you and I'm gonna send you a helper. It's good that I leave you. I'm gonna send you a helper, the Holy Spirit of God. Then Acts chapter one, verse eight, we talked about this and read this last week. But Jesus, again, before he ascends into heaven, he says, you will receive power. Think about that. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Right after that, Jesus ascends. He sits at the right hand of the Father and then just 10 days later is when the Holy Spirit is poured out at Pentecost. So Jesus goes to the cross On the third day, he's raised from the grave. 40 days later, he ascends into heaven. And then 10 days after that is when the Holy Spirit descends on God's people. So again, I ask this question, the same question that's asked in Acts chapter two, verse 12. What does this mean? What does it mean to be empowered by the Holy Spirit? And the first truth that we see here in the text is this, that the power of the Holy Spirit, it comes from outside of you. The power of the Holy Spirit comes from outside of you. How do we know this? Let's look back at the text. Look with me again at verse two. It says, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. They experienced something outside of them. The sound, it comes from heaven. And so what this tells us is that to be filled with the Holy Spirit means to receive something that is outside of us. To be empowered by the Holy Spirit is not something that you are born with, but rather it is something that you receive. And I think that this is really important. We're gonna show a couple of things I wrote down here um, that really dive into this uh, that I wanna read for us up on the screen. It's this. It says, our culture tells you that your problems come from outside of you and that you can find your truth inside of you. Let me say that again. Really think about what I'm saying. Our culture tells you that your problems come from outside of you and that you can find your truth inside of you. Just look at, look at Disney. Look at all the movies. It's like the power is within you. However, next slide. However, the Bible teaches that the problem is inside of you and that the solution actually comes from outside of you. This is really, really important for us. There's this thing. It's called original sin. None of us are, are born with the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of us. We're born with uh, original sin. We're little sinners um, from, from birth. And um, while you probably don't need some examples, I'm gonna share some, because do I have any parents in here? All right, and if you have kiddos, then you know that we are born in a sin. In fact, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of people that I'm, actually, these are just examples from my own house, household and from my own home, of ways in which we know our kids and that we're born innately in sin. And they all have to do with yelling in the house. Have you ever ki- had your kids just yell in the house and expect you to be there like that? Every- I'm getting a lot of head nods. Yeah, they'll just be there and be like, Dad! D-. We know what they really say, right? Mom! Right? <laughs> they really say that. But an example from just a couple of weeks ago, I have a son, Roman, eight, wonderful little kid, little sinner, all right? He yells and screams, mom, mom, he's in his room. I really, the way that he's yelling, you think his room is on fire, right? And that something terrible is gonna happen. So Jenny rushes up there to check on him and he's laying there in his bed and he's like, mom, my clothes are on the floor and I, can, can you grab those for me and hand them up? Uh, it's just, we're, we're, na- we're, we're by nature self-centered. My daughter also, she's not exempt from this stuff. She'll, she'll be uh, hanging out. She'll have some snacks over on an end table or a drink, and she'll yell, Mom, Mom, come in there. Everything okay? No, I just, can you hand me my drink from, you guys know it happens in your household too, right? Or the worst one. This is, this is the one that, that gets really under my skin, kind of a pet peeve of mine. But when they're somewhere and they scream and yell and you go in there and they're like, hey, I can't find the remote. <laughs> can't find the remote. And then the first thing you know to do as a parent is say, stand up. 
Stand up. You see that that was right underneath you? That's, that's the remote. But all these just prove the point that by nature, we, we are, we're sinners. By nature, we are self-centered beings. Because of this, we oftentimes think that we can find power in ourselves, that we have this willpower, that's all we need. But really, when we think this way, it leads to powerlessness. So let me ask you this again, do you feel powerless in this place? It's likely that you're relying on your own strength and relying on your own power. So that's the first thing. What does this mean? The first thing we see about what it means to be empowered by the Holy Spirit is that it comes from outside of you. But the second thing is this, the power of the Holy Spirit lives within you. The power of the Holy Spirit lives within you. In Jesus Christ, when you place your faith in Jesus, you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit and it lives within you. Let's look back at the text. Pick up verse three. Verse three, it says, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And what does it say? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. One prominent way that we see God's glory, one prominent way that we see the presence of God represented in the Old Testament is one of fire. I love this. If you think through several example, examples in the Old Testament, God appears, his glory, his presence is there in the form of fire. Let me give you a couple examples. Genesis chapter 15, when God enters into a covenant with Abram, he appears to Abram in the presence of a torch. In Exodus chapter three, when God speaks to Moses, God is there in what? As a burning bush. When the Israelites are sojourning through the wilderness, so they've come out of Egypt and they've not gone into the promised land yet, we know that God would appear to them as a cloud by day and a fire by night, a pillar of fire. And then one that's a wonderful, beautiful depiction of fire is in Ezekiel chapter one. And we read that the glory of the Lord was all around and that the prophet sees fire flashing forth continually. And here's, here's the thing, and don't miss this. Everybody listen into this. When you repent of your sins and believe in Jesus, you now, have, you now have God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity living inside of you. This is a beautiful thing. I love what Pastor Tim Keller says about this, that the Holy Spirit indwells believers. He says that every believer, every person who places his or her faith in Jesus Christ, that they are now a burning bush. They are now a burning bush. The glory of God, the presence of God is now available when you place your faith in Jesus. And one thing I want you to notice too from the text is that when the Holy Spirit comes down and rests on the people there, it's not just on the apostles. It's not just on the super religious or the, the extra spiritual, but rather it, it rested on all of those there who placed their faith in Jesus. And this language is also um, everywhere um, in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit lives within Christians. A couple of them are gonna come up on the screen. Romans chapter eight and verse 16, it says this, that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Think about that. A lot of you are nodding. The Spirit himself bears witness that our spirit, that we are children of God. Then Galatians chapter four and verse six, it says this, and because you are sons, or you are sons and daughters, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son, Jesus Christ, into our hearts, the Holy Spirit into our hearts through Jesus, crying what? Abba, Father, Christian here in the worship center, those who've placed their faith in Jesus, if you are a believer, those who are watching online, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, I wanna tell you something. Lean in for just a moment. If you've drifted off at all, lean in with me. In Jesus Christ, you are a child of the living God. God the Father, yeah. God the Father, he delights in you. Jesus, when talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit in John, uh, John chapters 14 through 16, he says that the promised Holy Spirit will come to make real in your heart what I've been teaching you and what you've learned in your mind. So you, if you are in Jesus Christ, 
you have, listen to this, you have the same power in you that raised Jesus from the dead. That's a beautiful thing. So again, what does this mean? First, we see that the power of the Holy Spirit comes from outside of you. Second, we see that the power of the Holy Spirit lives within you when you're in Jesus Christ. But third, we see this, that the power of the Holy Spirit will work through you. The power of the Holy Spirit works through you. And this is so very important. Let's look back again at the text, picking up in verse four. And it says here that they all filled, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues at the Spirit gave them utterance. Look at this. It says that um, words were given to them by the Spirit. It says that men, as we move along, men from every nation under heaven, that they were all speaking in their own language. And then in verse 11, it tells us what they were talking about. It says they were telling of the mighty works of God. Telling of the mighty works of God. And what I think this means is that they were pointing to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were telling people about his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And Peter, when he gives this spirit-filled sermon here in just a moment in verses 15 through 36, um, which I'll, I'll share briefly, I'll do a survey of here in just a moment, um, he's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these men are joyfully obsessed with this gospel, so much so that others around them thought that they were drunk with wine. Friends, let me tell you this, that the source, uh, that the Holy Spirit is the source through which the gospel of Jesus Christ moves. Let me say that again. The Holy Spirit is the source through which the gospel of Jesus Christ moves. The power of the Holy Spirit, though, through God's sovereignty and how he chooses, works through his people to advance this universal message, and it all starts right here in Acts chapter two, right here in Acts chapter two. So let me briefly cover what happens in verses 14 through 36 there as Peter preaches the word of God. So he gives his spirit-filled sermon, and he points back to a couple of different places in the Old Testament, Joel chapter two, Psalm 16, and Psalm 110. And in all of those, he says how this points to Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah, and how the the Spirit will be poured out. Look with me. Joel, Peter uh, quotes the prophet Joel in verse 17, and he says that the, the Spirit of God will be poured out. From Joel, Peter also quotes in verse 21 that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Then from the author David in Psalm 16, he says that God will make me, God will make us full of gladness with the presence of God. And then in verses 31 and 32, Peter shares that uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that God raised Jesus from the dead and that this is the gospel. And then in verse 33, Peter says that Jesus is now exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are hearing and seeing. I would encourage you, if you have time this week, to go back and read this beautiful, spirit-filled sermon, verses 14 through 36. But as we begin to wrap up, I do want to ask a really important question, and it's this. Why did Jesus choose Pentecost as the day when he would pour out the Spirit of God on his disciples? Why did Jesus choose Pentecost as the day that he would pour out the Spirit of God on his disciples? So, in, uh, in the, th- this is a Jewish holiday uh, for the Jews, Pentecost. Um, there would be lots and lots of people all around the known world, Jewish people, who would all come together for this holiday called Pentecost in Jerusalem, in the holy city. And it got its name Pentecost because it literally means 50th, 50th. And this is because it took place 50 days from the Passover. So if you're not too familiar with the Passover, let me briefly explain that. And this, then the Pentecost will make a bit more sense. So in the Old Testament, when Moses um, brings the people out of Egypt, the 10th plague um, is called the Passover, where the Passover lamb, the blood was spilt so the death would pass over them. 
50 days later, fast forward to Exodus chapter 19, 50 days later, Moses is up on the mountain at Sinai and God enters into a relationship with his people. So you've got the Passover where the blood was spilt. 50 days later, God enters into a relationship with his people in the Old Testament. And so why does this matter? Because Acts chapter two is really a retelling of this or what I like to say, a fulfillment of what took place in the Old Testament. How so? Well, let me give you some ways in which the two are paralleled with one another. In, in Exodus 19, at Pentecost there, um, and in Acts chapter two, God came down. God came down on the mountain in Exodus 19. God comes down here with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter two. In both places, the fire descends on the scene, representing the glory and the presence of God. And in both cases, a message is given. Now, here's where things are different. In Exodus 19, the message was the word of the law that was given. But in Acts chapter two, it's the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ that is shared. In Exodus 19, Moses was the mediator between God and the people. He would talk to God and talk to the people as a mediator. But here in Acts chapter two, who is the mediator? Jesus. Jesus is the mediator. And why is this important? Because friends, we have a better man on the mountain. We have a better man on the mountain. Jesus is the perfect mediator and he didn't just talk to God on our behalf, but he died on our behalf. I mentioned earlier that I would briefly look at Acts um, chapter two, verses 36 through 39. And so now I wanna read these for us as we finish up this morning. So this is now at the end of Peter's sermon. And he finishes up by saying, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, listen to the question that the people who were there asked of Peter and the apostles. They said, brothers, what shall we do? And here's the response that Peter gives. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So in verse 37, um, it says that the people listening to Peter's sermon and his preaching that they were cut or they were pierced to the heart. And we shouldn't be surprised by this at all because Peter was preaching the word of God. Joel 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 110, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And from Ephesians chapter six and verse 17, we know that the word of God is also called the sword of the, come on, say it with me, the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit. Think about that for a moment. Acts chapter two, verse four, Peter, he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And so as he preaches the word of God, this is not the sword of Peter, but rather this is the sword of the Spirit that Pentecost morning. And at the uh, end of that section, we read that God cut to the heart 3,000 people and drew those people to himself in faith through Jesus Christ. And so to end, I wanna ask the same question that was asked of Peter and of the apostles there in Acts chapter two and verse 37, and it was this, what shall we do? Or fill in your name, what shall Ryan do? What shall I do? Well, they tell us three different things. If you're in this place and you've not put your trust in Jesus, this is what you need to do. Repent, receive forgiveness, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent means turn away from your sins. Receive forgiveness, place your faith in Jesus, and then the promised Holy Spirit will indwell you and you will be empowered. Second, get baptized. If you're in this place, if you're watching online, get baptized. Be obedient to the call on your life as now a follower of Jesus Christ and follow through in obedience in baptism. I'm gonna be up here at the end of the service. If you've yet to be baptized and you wanna talk about that, I wanna talk with you, okay? Here's the final, third thing. This is for those who've placed their faith in Jesus, but share the promise to your children and all who are far off. 
Share the promise to your children and all who are far off. God has moved in extraordinary ways um, in the history of the Christian church. Um, and he has poured out his spirit in what I would call fresh, new, uncustomary, and, and dramatic ways. And these, these times have often been called times of revival or awakening or reformation. And Pentecost was the first of these great outpourings of the, uh, the first great outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Christian church. And until the task of world evangelism is done, is completed, then I believe that it is our duty to pray for seasons um, of fresh, um, extraordinary outpourings of God's spirit to awaken us, to empower the church to go forth to the ends of the world. And, and I wanna give us a word, uh, just a brief word of caution with this because um, whenever revival comes, and I pray that it comes right here at Graceland, right here in Southern Indiana, but whenever revival comes, whenever the Holy Spirit is poured out in extraordinary ways, division often happens first in Christian community. Some people genuinely inquire as to what's happening and they test all things rightly and they hold fast to what is good, but others will stand outside and mock and write off this enthusiasm as merely human and do what some people did in Acts chapter two and say, they're just filled with new wine. And so I have a question for you, Graceland Church. Where do we stand in this? Where do we stand in this? We believe in a God of revival and we wanna see revival come. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, again, we bow before your throne. So grateful for your word. And that the sword of the spirit, it cuts it pierces the heart, and I pray, God, that you have done that today. Lord, that you've cut and pierced to the heart those who've heard this. God, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and I pray, Father, if there's a single person in here who's yet to receive that gift, that they would say yes today. God, we wanna see you move. We wanna be open-handed and available to your Spirit's leading, and so if you would see fit to bring about revival here at Graceland, God, I just pray that you would do it. Pray that you would do it, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we finish up and close out our service this morning. This is what we call a time of response. We do it each and every week, but don't let this become too familiar. And so I wanna invite you to pray right now. Several different reasons you could pray. One, something, something's happening in your life. You need prayer. We're gonna have prayer counselors up here. Come to the altar and to pray, bring a friend to come and pray with you. Two, if you have yet to place your faith in Jesus and you feel as though the, the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart today, come and talk with us, come talk with me. I'd love to talk with you about that. But let's be a church that prays for revival. And if you wanna pray for revival, I invite you to come and lift that up before the Lord. But let's sing, let's respond as the Spirit lead and as Steve leads us.